Good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone please to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent. Apologies have been received from Fulton McGregor and Jamie Green. Jamie Green will actually be joining us uh, at 10 o'clock. I think he's had some problems with transport in. Um, no doubt, uh, like everyone else this morning, he's been walking into work. Um, uh, as today is walking into work day. So agenda item one, uh, we're going to uh, receive an update from the Scottish Government on the high level output specification strategy for rail infrastructure in Scotland. I'd like to welcome Hamza Youssef, the Minister for Transport and the Islands, Bill Reevy from the Director of Rail at Transport Scotland and John Proven, the Head of Rail Strategy and Funding at the Scottish Government. Mr Youssef, I think you are going to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. And I can confirm I did walk into work uh, this morning. Uh, publication of an H loss is a regular, regulatory requirement under UK railway law. It sets out at a high level our day to day requirements for the Scottish Rail Network for the period 2019 to 2024, and how we plan to address future capacity constraints. It is accompanied by a statement of funds available, which outlines the level of public funding available to support our requirements. While the H-Loss is part of a regulatory process, it does enable us to provide a renewed focus on a high-performing, resilient rail network in Scotland and an opportunity to challenge the rail industry to deliver improved benefits for passengers and indeed for freight customers also. Development work on the H-Loss is at an advanced stage. We have consulted extens extensively with both public uh, and indeed uh, the Scottish rail industry, receiving well over 100 responses to our future infrastructure strategy consultation. Uh, based on this and our experience on, of the current and previous railway control periods, the H-Loss will have a particular focus on maintaining the current high levels of performance, which is amongst the best across the UK railway, uh, improving journey times and connectivity for passengers and freight users, continued growth in the rail freight sector, and indeed improving rail's green credentials. The age loss will also drive positive behaviour, uh, behaviours across the Scottish rail industry. While it primarily lays out our, our expectations of network rail, it will also ensure that network rail will pull together in alignment with the wider rail industry, with a clear focus on delivering our priorities for Scotland's railways. We have made considerable investment in Scotland's railways since 2007, with new lines and new stations, of course, such as the Borders Railway, Airdrie to Bathgate Line, Lawrence Kirk stations, and many others. This investment continues with major projects such as uh, Egypt, the redevelopment of Queen Street Station, and others in our 3.5 billion capital investment programme to 2019. However, it is no secret that there has also been significant challenges with the cost and delivery timescales of some of our major rail projects. We've been working closely with the rail indu industry in Scotland and indeed the regulator to help them to manage these more effectively. Uh, we've also challenged the industry in areas where there has been a clear need for improvement. Uh, the result of this work is, is there for all to see. We have not cancelled or deferred any of our committed scheme. Any delays to projects are measured in months rather than years, and we remain with the financial headroom set by the HM Treasury. Now, that's considerably different uh, picture compared to other parts of the UK railway, not where we want it to be, but certainly considerably better. However, we cannot have a repeat of project overruns in the next control period, particularly at a time where public finances are under unprecedented pressures. Uh, that is why the H loss will signal a move towards a pipeline-based approach to the, to the delivery of major capital schemes. This was supported by 63% of respondents to our consultation. This will bring significant improvement in project specification, development and governance, but importantly also greater oversight and discipline around the cost and delivery timescales of such projects. Uh, just to conclude, uh, convener, the timescales for the publication of the H loss have been affected, uh, of course, by the UK general election, as we will require certainty from Her Majesty's tre Treasury on the future funding arrangements for railways. However, we are working towards, of course, uh, meeting that statutory deadline set by the ORR for publication uh, no later than the 20th of July. Uh, the details of the pipeline approach will be set in our future rail enhancement and capital investment strategy, uh, which will be published uh, by the end of 2017. Of course, as always, happy to take questions. Okay, the first question, uh, Minister, is going to come from Stuart. 
Thank you very much. And before starting, I uh, make two declarations. I'm the Honorary President of the Scottish Association of Public Transport and Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK, both of which are uh, relevant to the subjects before us today. Stuart, sorry, can I just... Actually, that's a very good point, and thank you for reminding me. There may be other members who'd like to make a declaration at the start before we go any further. Um, the Deputy Convener. Uh, yes, thanks. I am Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Uh, John. Uh, I'm co-convener of the Cross Party Group on Rail. Okay. Rhoda. I'm also Honorary Vice President of the Friends of the North Highland Line. Um, I think that concludes all the declarations. Uh, sorry, Stuart, please continue. No, I'm, I'm sure the Minister is now well aware of our keen interest in committee and elsewhere in the subjects that are before us today. Um, let me, I've got three questions on slightly different subjects. Um, the, the first of which is basically uh, how does the H loss tie in with uh, wider policies and practice uh, for uh, transport in Scotland? Because railways don't stand alone from other modes of transport. Okay. Um, integration of uh, between modes of transport. Uh, it's hugely uh, important. So H loss, as the name suggests, the high level output specification um, specifies what a high level expectation is in terms of performance. Um, and that can include, of course, journey time improvements, as well as improving the passenger experience. Now, a key part of improving that uh, passenger experience, of course, is um, the integration of transport. You're absolutely right that uh, uh, <clears throat> people taking their journey will often go from, uh, you know, think about uh, the, the service that, that, that runs from Adrossan to, to, to Brodick, for example, will often take the railway down to uh, Adrossan to then go across to Arran. Uh, and so the integration is an important part, but it's set at, at a very high level. Um, and this is where some of the conversation is going around performance. Um, PPM is a good measure. Um, it's one that, 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 that I think, though, we could look to supplement and complement. So when it comes to other forms of transport, uh, you know, we will look at how to improve the passenger experience, and part of that may well be uh, how we better integrate uh, modes of, of transport. Um, can, I, can I just pick up on that, uh, Minister? You chose to refer to integration between ferries and railways, but of course the majority of the ferries are uh, controlled by the government, so I suppose, therefore, you have both sides of the integration at your hand, largely. But in the case of buses and, uh, and, and indeed cars, walking and uh, cycling, it's more fundamentally difficult. Do you have anything useful to say about how HLOS might uh, support wider strategy in relation to those modes of transport? Yeah, well, HLOS could do, but it's important to mention the fact that um, under the franchise agreement, ScotRail is required. Uh, to work with Transport Scotland and other stakeholders such as RTPs, local authorities, ferries, subway, trams, airport operators, taxi associations for the purpose of improving transport integration in Scotland. So that includes delivering, of course, integrated ticketing, uh, which is a huge bit of piece of work that's been taken forward uh, with local authorities, with bus companies on stop locations. Um, for example, funding of, of £200,000 has been made available to ScotRail to work with the wider transport integration group. Uh, examples of projects being delivered, for example, uh, would be wayfinding and multimodal screens at Oban, at Elgin, uh, Inverness, Thurso. Um, so, so there's a lot that, that, that's going on in terms of integration uh, with other modes of transport. Um, H loss will set the kind of high level specifications, but the franchise agreement actually uh, really compels, compels the train operating company to, to, to already do that. My colleague Rhoda will come back to that, I think, in more uh, detail. Let me uh, uh, just move on to the responses to the, uh, uh, the consultation. Uh, in particular, in your preliminary remarks, you highlighted that there was broad agreement uh, to the consultation on the pipeline approach. Uh, how are you going to respond to other areas that uh, arose in the consultation? Well, we were really pleased with the level of response and, and the fact that we actually went out to various communities and, and in fact uh, members of the Scottish Parliament who felt that we weren't going to their particular communities got in touch with me and, and said you know we want you to come to our constituency and so we, we did our best to, to do that as much as we possibly could so the first thing to say is I'm pleased at the level of engagement uh, on, on that 114 consultation responses received as you say agreement on the uh, a large agreement uh, on, on, on the uh, pipeline approach. Um, 
72% of respondents also agreed in our vision uh, for, for, for rail as well, which is pleased about. I think where there's um, work to do and, and where we're uh, examining further uh, what we can put into the H losses around climate change and um, clear, strong support for rail being parts of uh, the emission reduction targets that we've set. Uh, also, um, clear from the industry that they felt that governance and transparency were an issue. So um, I think there's, again, some work for, for, for us to explore about how, how we do that and, and our frustrations around governance and transparency uh, around major projects, I think, is something that's been well rehearsed at this committee and, and that I've made mention of in public as well. So, um, you know, that's why we'd want to move towards that uh, pipeline um, approach. I suppose the last thing I would say is that there was clear support also to ensure that rail freight was part of the uh, part of the, the the conversation, but not just part of the conversation, that there was ambitious targets for rail freight. Um, so again, that's something that uh, that we'll be considering in the age laws. Um, for my part, Minister, I'm easily pleased. Progress on the Buck and Link, perhaps to Ellen first, and then on to Peter Head and Fraser. But will keep me uh, well chuffed for the next while. However, there will be other competition. Um, and speaking of competition, in particular, the government has made substantial commitments uh, to invest in dueling trunk roads. Um, and uh, in your opening remarks, again, you made reference to uh, the increasingly uh, restrictive access to, to capital. How do you think the, uh, the focus that there is on these uh, trunk road investments is going to play out against uh, the much-needed investments in rail? Uh, so always, um, as, uh, as a minister, you have to find that balance. Uh, I think people understand that. And you know, if we look at some of the numbers and, and the figures, we look at the 1718 uh, budget, um, Transport, Transport, Transport Scotland budget for 1718, 748 million pounds spent on rail, 823.3 million spent on uh, trunk roads, motorways, and trunk roads, and that compares to around about four percent of commuter journeys done by rail where 66% of commuter journeys are done by car or van. So, you know, we are um, spending considerably uh, on rail to try to encourage that modal shift uh, from, from the road uh, to rail. Uh, that doesn't mean that we, we stop investing in our trunk roads. Uh, this committee and other committees have noted the Audit Scotland report on, on the condition of, of, of our trunk roads, and uh, although they are now... Uh, a better state than, than perhaps um, uh, local roads. They still uh, very much the Audit Scotland report rightly says that they need some uh, attention. So you know we can't uh, can't take our eye off maintaining our current assets plus adding to them where necessary. The drilling of the A9 and the A96 is going to be of huge benefit uh, to have our trunk roads, all of our cities connected by trunk road. Uh, you know something that is uh, that, that is going to be. Um, good for our, 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 our economic growth, uh, but also will tackle many other issues uh, along the way as well. So it's about finding a balance. Minister. Um, Peter. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, during the consultation, uh, several respondents raised concerns that cap capacity improvements appear to be focused on the existing network rather than reopening some of the old lines, for example, to St Andrews and north of Aberdeen to Ellen and Peterhead, for example. Um, I, would, I would welcome your comments on that. And are there any plans to reopen some of these lines that were closed several decades ago? Um, you know, I was reflecting yesterday was a year since um, the government was appointed, so a year since uh, I've been in the role, and I've managed to, to meet a number of very dedicated passionate campaigners about the railway in their local community uh, uh, and you know uh, it's unfair because I think they sometimes get a you know a bit of a bad press but uh, they are real real enthusiasts and um, uh, you know their energy some of them have dedicated literally their whole lives to see certain lines open uh, as, as the member mentions um, and for me there's, there's again got to be a balance so we absolutely have to strengthen existing assets where they exist, I think, and renewing uh, existing assets. Um, that's important. Uh, but at the same time, we should absolutely not be closed off to uh, re uh, re uh, investing in, in new lines at all. And we've got a good track record in that. Airdrie to Bathgate line in 2010, for example, Borders line in, in 2015, a uh, total of 14 new stations that have been opened since 2007. So we've shown that there's a commitment there or a track record there to opening uh, 
uh, new lines. Um, you know, I, I, I know many uh, campaign groups will be very, very interested in their rail projects. Uh, what you won't see in HLOS, if I can just make that very clear, though, what you won't see, because HLOS, again, by, by its very nature, by its name, its high-level output specification, you're not going to have detail of an HLOS. What I'm keen to, to uh, detail of, of, of every single project that we would fund in the control period, because what I'm keen to avoid is a prescriptive list which has very early, unrealistic, excuse me, cost estimates, only then for Network Rail to come back three years later to say, actually, the cost of this has doubled or tripled or quadrupled because, you know, it was a very early cost estimate. What I'm keen to do is have a pipeline. So there's a number of projects, some of which you've already mentioned, that are in that. But saying to these projects, once you have a robust business case that's been developed to a stage that we're satisfied with, whether that's grip three or four or some, some other part of the process, then that's when we start to, to, to release the funds because we've got a better idea of the cost. So um, the projects that the member mentioned are, are all ones that um, you know, have come, under my, come to my desk before and, and ones that uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't discount from that kind of flexible pipeline-based approach. But I hope that gives them some kind of reassurance. A wee bit, but uh, it's obviously quite a bit down the line, if you pardon the pun. Yeah. Um, how do you intend to balance value for money between the taxpayer and the fair payer? And do you intend the fair payer to fund a greater proportion of rail operating costs in the future in Scotland? Uh, no would be the, 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 the kind of short answer to that. I mean, when it comes to fares in Scotland, we've taken action. Uh, on fares, I'm very proud of that. I mean, the majority of fares, for example, do not rise above, above RPI. And um, when it comes to off-peak regulated fares, they can only rise 1% below RPI. So fare rises, although nobody, you know, you know welcomes, of course, if you're travelling the railways, you don't want your fare to increase. That's uh, that kind of general common sense that you hear from people. But if they are going to rise, they are capped here uh, in Scotland. In addition to, to fares, fares initiatives, you know, the free week that many... Uh, passengers have claimed this month, um, so no, we wouldn't expect um, that burden to be uh, be on on on, on fair uh, paying uh, customers. Okay, thank you. Did you want to come in on that? To go on to my yes, yes, please. Um, just a follow up on um, how projects get in. Um, I mean, there's things obviously missing Glasgow Crossrail. There's things in my own constituency where. Um, the Kyle line is maybe looking to share road and rail. How do those projects, and I suppose how do ca local campaigners know that those are actually part being in consideration? You know, if it's that flexible, how, how do people have an idea that's going to happen and where it's going to feed in and when it's going to become a priority? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And um, I hope that the flexible pipeline approach shows that we're not going to discount any projects. Whereas if you had a prescriptive list X, Y, Z, um, then, then there's absolute certainty that other projects can't get in. So, you know, you're, you're very, very prescriptive, you're very rigid, you're very narrow. Whereas a flexible pipeline essentially says, look, there's a number of projects that we consider. We shouldn't discount any of them. But where we come to funding them, when it comes to making the final decision, they have to go through a process. So in terms of um, you know, the lines that you've mentioned, uh, my, my advice would be um, to follow the advice of, of many other campaign groups would be uh, you know, get the stakeholders together. So that's usually the regional transport partnership, the local authority or authorities that may be involved in this and work with Transport Scotland in relation to the STAG process. Um, to get that transport appraisal done through, through, through the guidelines that we have. Um, get that business case worked up and where Transport Scotland can help to guide through that process. Now, you know, we've got to be, you know, there's only so much we can do, of course, but if we can help and Transport Scotland can help to guide campaign groups through that process, I'd be more than happy uh, to, to do that. And Transport Scotland would be happy uh, to do that. Uh, my only point with the, with the pipeline is that um, we want to have certainty over the robustness of the business case plus certainty of the cost as much certainty as we can get the cost so that then uh, you know we know how much we're, we're going to commit I, I guess it's if people are looking for solutions to issues and the Kyle line is one of them where the storm ferry bypass has been a problem pretty much all of my life and um, if people are then looking at that as a possible um, solution to that to the problem sharing road and rail 
um, they work up a proposal and then it falls way down in the list of priorities, then it's very difficult to put a timeline on that when, when a road becomes safe again. So I, I don't know if there is a way of prioritising urgent cases where something needs to happen quite quickly. Oh, yeah, and, and, and the member is, 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 is right to highlight that um, you know, these, th th there's a limited pot of funding, and, and I'll come, maybe I'll come to the statement of funds and how much funding is available later, later on, but um, clearly we have a limited pot of, of not even funding, I mean, there's a kind of debt that we can't go over, a debt ceiling that we can't go over, and therefore there will have to be a level of prioritisation, but the STAG process can help to make that case, because you know, look into things, um, you know, not just the, the robustness of the business case, but, you know, is a particular area remote? Is it isolated? Uh, would it help with the social, economic kind of conditions in that particular geography? So I, I don't know the intricacies of, 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 of the line that the member's talking about, but if Transport Scotland can provide further guidance on that, how to make that case um, in line with STAG, um, uh, regulations, then we'd be happy to, to provide that advice. Okay. Um, can I move on to um, my substantive question, which is about integration of transport forms, um, following on from Stuart Stevenson's questioning. I mean, examples of where government are involved, for instance, um, kind of the Malig line, the ferry comes in 20 minutes after the train leaves Malig, um, which should be somewhere within the gift of Transport Scotland to do something about to places where you're dependent on um, privately operated bus companies to wait for ferries. And the same with buses and trains, because in, certainly in my, my constituency, in my region, um, you are not so, you know, it's buses and trains and sometimes local buses. How can we make transport more integrated? How can we allow, especially, um, you know, people who are tourists to the area to, to know how they travel about? And how do we stop um, when bus systems are subsidised and some of that, those contracts are lost, some add-on services are then lost? So. You know, it seems that the whole system is relatively chaotic at the moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I have had a lot of correspondence with um, those involved in the Malig Armadale uh, route and Slate Transport Forum and, and, and many others uh, that have been involved uh, uh, in that service. And, uh, you know, I share a lot of the frustration. So we are looking for solutions where we can better integrate transport. What I, what I would say is when I ask the question, um, I, I was taken into the uh, control room uh, that, uh, that, that, that uh, Scott Rail have in uh, Glasgow, and I was shown how just altering one train by a few minutes, what the impact on the entire rest of the network it can have on journey times, even in parts that aren't connected to that particular service. So sometimes, although the solution might seem fairly simple, and, and, and I respect the absolute reason why the member's asking that question on that particular route, it can have a, a big impact on uh, the rest of the network that's undesirable. Um, but I agree with her, her, her overall thrust of her, her question. You know, integration of transport is a vital, vital part and of, of the work that I do and that we do in, in Transport Scotland. Integrated um, ticketing, uh, smart ticketing is, why, is an important part of that agenda. Um, the, the ability to be able to use one ticket to multi-modes of transport, uh, I think, will help with that integration, will force particularly some of those commercial operators to talk to the likes of ScotRail and the likes of uh, uh, CalMac uh, as well. So that conversation is taking place. But if there are specific areas, geographies, constituencies, where integration between the various modes of transport could be done better, I would urge members to, to, to contact me um, I'll certainly sit down and speak to the relevant uh, uh, transport providers and we'll try to work up a solution as we best can. But sometimes they're, they, they, they're, there's the solution that might seem obvious can have a very detrimental impact on the rest of the network. And if that is the case, I would just be very upfront with members and just say that is the reason why it can't be done. But yes, it's a huge, um, it's a huge frustration, I know, for commuters and passengers. Uh, and I'd be happy to see what more we can do to mitigate uh, some of the negative effects of of that. I, I can understand that rail times are difficult because 
you know, you're dealing with a railway and there's knock-on effects. Um, but surely things like ferry timetables, which are very much in the gift of Government Transport Scotland and indeed ferry companies, surely that could be changed relatively easily by a matter of minutes to allow connections to happen because it's really frustrating for people to then have a very long journey which could be much more dovetailed. It's, it's fair to say that when we make ferry timetable changes to summer and winter ferry timetables, we consult extensively with local communities. Uh, you know, we, we, we uh, engage with them, the ferry user groups uh, and on those islands in particular, but also uh, including uh, groups that are on the mainland uh, as well. So there's a lot of consultation that goes goes into that. It'd be unfair to think that CalMAC also don't have some sort of restrictions, for example, when it comes to crew numbers, uh, the hours that they work, rest hours, and so on and so forth. Um, but where adjustments can be made, again, my, my offer uh, is a genuine one. If the member thinks that uh, tweaking a timetable by a couple of minutes could make a huge difference to <clears throat> the, the, those that she represents, then, then I'd be happy to, to look into that to have a conversation with CalMAC who, and, 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 and see what can and can't be done. But there may well be very good reasons why, why certain things can't be done. I mean, CalMAC are not in the business of trying to make things, trying to be unhelpful. They are very, very helpful in terms of uh, a company. They, they look to engage. They have a community uh, uh, you know, engagement uh, officer and director, Brian, Brian Fulton, um, who will meet communities to, to have a conversation with them. So if there is something that we can do, then I'd be open-minded to, to, to looking at it. Minister, I'm sure you're going to get lots of letters as a result of uh, that, not only from members, but from members of the public to try and make sure that, that services interconnect. But before you do, I think John's got a question, and then we're going to move on to Richard. Thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, Minister. It was just a supplementary on that. Uh, that on the surface is a generous offer, Minister, that put people to get in touch, but surely it's self-evident. There's a lot of planning goes into these timetables. It doesn't need concerned citizens from the Western Isles uh, to, to, to explain that there isn't coordination in some of these instances. Is that something that f officials... I mean, it may be that there are limitations and nothing can be done, but um, it shouldn't have to be explained, I would have thought, um, no, if no, there's been a rigorous assessment prior to the no. compilation of timetables. No, no, it goes back to my previous <coughs> answer. It goes back to my previous answer that there is extensive conversation with the communities before both the summer and the winter timetable are published. Uh, can you keep everybody happy uh, with the limited amount of vessels that CalMAC have? Of course not. And some of those cases are well known, well documented in the public uh, domain. But um, and, and, and the popularity of our islands um, and the accessibility and the affordability to, to many of our islands as a result of RET, for example, but also because of the great marketing the islands have done uh, themselves uh, is a good thing. But let's not pretend that that doesn't have challenges. The popularity the, with, the, with a limited number of vessels that are ageing, and we have two vessels that are being built at the moment at Ferguson's, we know that, but they won't come into service until 2018. So we have a limited amount of vessels. Um, some of them are, are, are of course, uh, nearing the end of their, their shelf life. We do have constraints, and so we have to manage the network. CalMAC, particularly in the summer and the winter, it's a little bit easier. Of course it is, but in the, in the summertime, we have to manage that network and cascade vessels. And of course, the member will be fully aware that some vessels only fit in certain ports uh, because of tidal restrictions or not. So there's another conversation to be had about how do we standardise some of that. So there are constraints. It would be unhelpful to suggest that there aren't constraints. And what I would say to the member is extensive consultation is done. In terms of this summer timetable, the vast majority of those that we consulted with were pleased with, with the summer timetable. There were some that were absolutely not. And, and, and again, they're probably well known uh, to the committee, but we're still continuing to work with them to, to tweak what we can. So no, you're right, it doesn't take concern because it is, we do, or CalMAC does a lot of extensive discussion with community groups, but um, you know, keeping everybody happy with everybody's ambitions and desires, it sometimes can be constrained by the, the, the capacity constraints, the vessel constraints that we have. Thank you. Um, Minister, I'd like to bring in Richard now with some questions on... Good morning, Good morning <laughs> Minister. Um, can we turn to the reclassification of network rail? What impact do you see might the reclassification of network rail as a public body have on the availability of funds for future expansion an enhancement of the Scottish Rail Network. Mm. Um, the reclassification of, of, of Network Rail, obviously a decision taken by 
uh, the UK government and, and HMR Treasury and, and DFT uh, at the time, uh, for, uh, September 2014, I think, when the decision uh, was taken. I mean, there's a couple of obvious uh, points, but they're worth kind of reiterating and, and re-emphasizing here. Uh, obviously, uh, that resulted in network rails financing and debt being transferred onto the public books, um, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, lending coming from the market. So, you know, lending is having to come from from the treasury. Uh, so there's there's obviously a number of uh, criteria that have to be met now that that, that, that uh, debt is on the is on the public uh, books. Um, the mechanics and the funding arrangements, therefore, I mean, it's from a Scottish perspective, we receive, and I'll look to my officials to keep me right here, but we essentially get 11.17% of, of, of the debt financing, um, which is an arrangement that, that we currently have. Now, we're within that headroom at the moment for a control period uh, five. Um, very, you know, it's, it, the, the general election means that we can't, have conversations with the Treasury at the moment and the DFT about what their plans are for the next control period. Um, but it's fair to say that um, you know we would look for a, a fair and equitable settlement for Scotland, um, just as, as we have. But uh, you know we'll continue to meet our statutory obligations to, to fund us a, a high-performing uh, railway while continuing to invest. And as I say, discussions with the Treasury um, continue. I, I don't think it's... Um, you know, I think from the conversations that I've had with the DFT, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, but uh, you know, they also have their frustrations uh, with Network Rail, despite it being reclassified. You know, there, there's a number of projects that have been cancelled, that have been deferred uh, south, south of the border, and um, this is not just about reclassifying Network Rail uh, as a public, uh, as a body under 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 Department for Transport. It's about how do we improve Network Rail's governance, transparency, and accountability uh, as well. Right. Uh, basically, the, the Scottish involvement in the management and funding of network what rail operations is currently governed by the Memorandum of Understanding between the UK and the Scottish Government, along with ring fence borrowing arrangements which expire in 2019. How well has this worked? Uh, has it been good in practice? And what arrangements are being made for borrowing in the post-2019 period? Um, yeah, not, not to just go over my, my, my last answer, but uh, in fairness to the Department for Transport, the relationship between DFT and Transport Scotland is very good and it works very well. doesn't mean there aren't tensions, doesn't mean there aren't difficulties, but generally that relationship works uh, pretty well. Um, my own relationship with my UK counterparts, again, uh, is, is fairly positive, fairly constructive. Again, we don't always agree and we'll always push further. Uh, they'll often push back. But generally speaking, the accessibility, the conversation, uh, the engagement is constructive around this issue of, of, of network rail. So they work well, um, the, 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 the arrangements through the MOU. Uh, what I would say, just to reiterate my, my, my previous answer, is that there's a general election at the moment. That there's no progress that can be made on the statement of funds available. Now, hopefully that's not going to impact on um, our publication of, of, of H loss, but clearly, you know, not knowing what the funding mechanism is going to be. So uh, I know DFT are exploring various options, you know, is it is it debt financing, is it grant aid, is it whatever? They're exploring a variety of options it will be for the DFT and of course I think ultimately the Treasury to make a decision on that. All we ask for and will continue to ask for is a fair and equitable settlement for Scotland. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, you've asked for uh, full devolution of rail to Scotland. Uh, how might that work in practice? And would the UK's uh, Office of Road and Rail remain the economic and safety regulator? And indeed, would the RAIB remain uh, the uh, investigation on accidents? Uh, is that the way you would see things? Yeah, uh, network rail devolution even if we can't get political cons consensus around the full devolution of network rail, then I'm hoping members from across the political spectrum would see that there is value in exploring whether or not the infrastructure projects element of network rail, plus probably the timetable element of it, should be should be uh, fully devolved to Scotland. And you know that's not just our view. Members will be fully aware of uh, the report from Reform Scotland, which strongly backed. Uh, network rail devolution, uh, co-authored by former transport minister and the UK government, uh, Tom Harris. So there was a, a kind of strong view there that um, because uh, you know net network rail um, is funded by the Scottish taxpayer to 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 
um, develop projects, to take forward projects on our Scottish railways, then they should be accountable, not just to this government, but essentially to this parliament. Um, I don't know how many times, if at all, the head of Network Rail has appeared in front of this committee. I have no idea, but I suspect probably not very many times, and I don't know how accountable um, Network Rail as a body necessarily is. Um, I, I feel uh, that, that that devolution certainly should happen, even if members don't agree that it should be full devolution, at least of the infrastructure projects and preferably the timetable elements, which are currently done at Milton Keynes as well. In terms of the, the wider questions around the ORR, again, we have a very constructive uh, relationship with, with, with the ORR, with the regulator. The regulator has, as they often say, two kind of main functions. One is the, the safety regulation uh, of, of, of the real this kind of safety critical role of the ORR. Uh, in my perspective, taking a GB wide approach is, is is not something I'm opposed to, uh, you know. And, and, and again, that would happen, you know, we would see how we would, how far we would get in conversation with the ORR about that. So, you know, uh, we have a number of cross border routes, so it may well make more sense for the ORR to remain the kind of GB wide regulator of the safety critical role on the economic side. Uh, you know, economic uh, regulation should be, in my opinion, an enabler for an efficient, high performing uh, rail industry, which is focused on uh, the maximum benefits for passengers, both uh, and also for freight users as well. So uh, it may be sensible to evaluate whether the system of economic regulation, whether that is fit for purpose, because you know, I've already mentioned the fact that there's some real issues around project delivery or whether that is uh, devolved closer to Scotland. So, you know, uh, and in terms of invest real investigations, again, I'd be open-minded to, to having a conversation uh, with the appropriate bodies around whether or not uh, that is a function best served UK-wide uh, or indeed uh, devolved to Scotland. So I'm not... Um, you know, I'm not politically sensitive about these issues. You know, for me, it's about getting the uh, maximum accountability and transparency um, for the Scottish taxpayer. The uh, Northern Irish model, where Belfast and uh, Dublin have mm. been able to cooperate, for example, in redevelopment of the line between the two cities very effectively, is that a, a model worth looking at where the responsibility all lies uh, for the Northern Ireland network in Belfast? Yes. A commendably short answer. Um, John is the uh, uh, next question. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, thanks. Uh, Minister, you've mentioned the pipeline uh, approach a number of times already, and I just wonder if we could have we look at that in more detail. If you could just explain to us perhaps how is that different from what we've had before and how, how would you see, can you give any practical examples of different decisions that might be made because we're using the pipeline project rather than what went before? Um, you know, the current system where there is a prescriptive list of projects, we'll ask Network Rail to give us an early cost estimate of those. They'll give us an early cost estimate of those. Those projects will be signed off. And lo and behold, a few years later, uh, Network Rail will come back and those projects will often be uh, overrun and uh, overpriced. Uh, well, underpriced, but they'll come back asking for, for more money for, for, for those projects. That, to me, doesn't seem like an efficient way of doing real investment projects. And I think generally there's a consensus around the political spectrum that things can be done in a much better better way. And that's not to excuse Network Rail. You know, I'm extremely disappointed in any of the overruns that happened. And, you know, uh, I won't go back into, uh, again, what's been well rehearsed. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of the issues around the, the, the regulatory compliance in particular... Uh, could have been foreseen. Uh, that being said, the pipeline approach essentially, um, you know, a recent uh, a recent experience on project delivery plus the feedback to the consultation uh, showed that there was a good level of support uh, for this because the pipeline would hopefully give far greater certainty over costs. Uh, time scales um, that will ultimately benefit the passenger freight user, but also importantly the taxpayer. Um, so the pipeline approach will bring greater focus to the industry working together to examine all of the options for improving capacity, you know, such as exploiting timetable, rolling stock options to get more. When it comes to real investments, um, you know, th there's a number of projects that are under development at the moment. So if you think about uh, resting in East Linton stations, working Aberdeen to the central belt uh, improvements, 
that were in addition to the city deal money that was given, uh, work in the Far North Line that's been done by the Far North Line Review Group uh, as well. Uh, if these um, projects come with, uh, with enhancements that they wish to make, uh, or indeed, you know, robust business cases on the stations that they wish to open. Uh, all we're saying is that um, instead of at this stage closing off what can and cannot be funded, we should work with them. They should develop the early, co the, sorry, the, the robust cost estimates, the robust business case, and if they come back with a level of detail that gives us confidence around that, uh, then they should progress to, to, to of course, ultimately. Uh, being funded, uh, if that is uh, the, the right thing for us to do. So um, no project at all should be disadvantaged by the changes. In fact, if anything, um, it may result in projects being agreed, for example, midway through a funding cycle or a control period. There's no, requirem no requirement is now being placed on if you're not in the H loss, you're not in XYZ document, then you won't be funded. So there's, it's, it's more flexible, it's more open, but it is very much based on the need for robust cost estimates. So if we take something like the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Project, which has had a problem with price uncertainty, under the pipeline scheme, would you then delay the start of a project like that until there was more certainty? I mean, I don't like um, comparing projects that are already underway, though I understand the reason my member asked the, the, the question. Uh, but essentially, you know, the projects that are currently taking place, I, I think if we were given, if we had agreed to fund them when more detailed work had been done around the uh, potential costs, uh, particularly around those projects that rely on electrification, as Egypt, SDA, many other projects, we would have not been as surprised at uh, perhaps some of the, uh, the the cost increase and some of the delay. That is not to excuse network rail at all, because as I say, there are some things, for example, the the regulatory rail compliant railway safety compliance um, that, that that was used, that the issues around that that caused delay and cost overrun, in my opinion, could have been overseen. So it's not to suggest that the pipeline approach is going to mean that uh, Network Rail are never going to delay another project. I think there are some, as I've already said, some questions that you know we have to, and conversations we have to have with the DFT and that we continue to have with Network Rail around their um, you know, ability to, to, not just uh, to, their ability to, to uh, uh, develop uh, railway projects and, and, and to, to see them through to conclusion. I suppose, I'm st frankly, I'm still struggling, and I accept you don't want to revisit old projects, but on the other hand, unless we get examples of how the pipeline project scheme would be different from what we've done in the past, I suppose I'm struggling to understand what decisions might be made differently. I mean, if we take another example like Borders Rail, now that's been very successful and I'm very supportive of it, but some people might feel that Borders Rail went ahead because local politicians and groups shouted very loudly rather than because it was the best project in Scotland at that time. So, I mean, would the pipeline project, again, make any difference to, to that kind of thing? And maybe, you know, somewhere else that wasn't shouting so loudly, like Leavenmouth or Glasgow Crossrail, would they get a better chance under the new system than they did under the old system? Well, I would say that you do a disservice to the campaigners at Leavenmouth who shout very loudly about their campaign. Uh, quite understandably, quite rightly, uh, and uh, they've come to meet me on a number of occasions. Uh, I've had, uh, as they, as have members uh, of the Scottish Parliament who represent their case, uh, also, uh, and I should say on, on, on leaving mouth that uh, conversations continue between Transport Scotland and, and the Council on that one. And uh, you know, it's uh, again through our flexible pipeline approach that is the type of project that uh, working through that pipeline can develop cost estimates that are robust, business case that are robust, and if so, should be able to progress to the next stage. I mean, there's some specific examples of, you know, where we've done delivery slightly different. Winchborough Queen Street Tunnel uh, closures have represented two kind of, of the most significant planned disruptions since the current uh, Scottish Alliance became operational. Uh, both major works were delivered on time uh, and on budget, uh, with the experience gained on, on both 
from these closures, uh, they, they, they show that a unified uh, approach by the industry is, is, is much better uh, than, than, than perhaps the model that's been used in other projects. Paisley Canal electrification project, uh, you know, again, deliverable uh, under the, the original ScotRail lines involving first to deliver three years ahead of uh, the original plans and less than half the anticipated cost. So there are projects that we can learn from that have been delivered uh, and uh, delivered uh, well. So um, when it comes to the pipeline approach, it does allow uh, a kind of controlled release um, of funds, and I think that's you know where we want to where we want to be. So it's not about projects shouting the loudest or not. Um, you know, as, as, as a member categorised it. Um, it is about the robustness of a business case, which is not just about pure economics and numbers, it's also about regeneration, the social impacts it can have, uh, as well as the, 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 the economic case. But they have to be robust before we release funds, I think. Is, but, you know, again, we're at, we haven't released the H loss, so it's fair to say we're still exploring, you know, how we, how we do this uh, internally. Uh, but the H loss, once it's published, will be able to give greater detail on that. And then once the uh, rail enhancement and capital investment document is also released at the end of the year, that will give f further detail on the pipeline approach. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, is Mike's question. But before I go to that, can, <clears throat> Minister, you've been giving very full answers. If, if I could uh, encourage you to be um, as detailed but as, as brief as possible. Mike, sorry. Th thank you, <coughs> convener. If I could first of all, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, put on record my thanks to the minister for facilitating a meeting I had on Monday at Inch Railway Station with Nestrand's officials uh, to progress the issue of disabled access, and that's hence my, my question. I know the minister's keen to make sure this sort of facility is, is progressed, and I appreciate that. But my question, therefore, is concerning uh, the consultation proposal, or oh, consideration uh, merging several of the separate rail investment funds such as the Scottish Stations Fund into general capital into a general capital budget now these funds were developed to access particular uh, to address particular issues such as disabled access at stations can you um, give us an assurance that if if these separate funds are abolished then it wouldn't lead to these issues being somehow lost or subsumed into the generality um, I feel, as the member started with uh, my uh, praising uh, me, I should just retire, to be honest, and call it a day. But uh, oh, I, I should end on a high. It doesn't always uh, have to be confrontational. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let me let me also re reciprocate by saying I know the member has uh, long uh, championed accessibility issues, particularly at the station. So I'm pleased that the meeting yesterday went well, and I hope it comes to a fruitful uh, conclusion. Uh, in terms of his, the substance of his question, I, I'm very aware of um, some nervousness around amalgamating all the funds into the kind of general pot. So, you know, Scottish Stations Fund, accessibility, other funds that we have, freight funds. Um, I, and I don't want to prejudge the publication of the H loss, but because of those concerns, I would say, personally, I'm um, minded and sympathetic to, to ring fencing, because I can see the the importance and the confidence and the reassurance that might give people. But there are there are also dangers with ring fencing. Ring fencing, of course, can be too rigid. And so we need to see how do we uh, increase the flexibility around some of those funds. But on balance, again, without prejudging, because we do have to have, you know, this conversation is, is going on internally, that uh, on balance, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, minded to to, 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 towards ring fencing, but uh, I'd be keen to hear members' uh, opinions uh, on that uh, as well, because they're good arguments on both sides, I have to say, of, of this debate. That's fine. Uh, thank you. Uh, John. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Minister, um, a, few, a few occasions in response to earlier questions, you used the phrase, if I noted you correctly, or variants of it, robustness over the business case. Um, emissions from rail account for 1% of all transport emissions. Can you outline how rail will contribute to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions over the five years from 2019, please? Uh, yes, I think it's, an, uh, it's going to be an important part of uh, our H loss uh, document uh, specifying new emissions reduction targets, which are of course linked to our own climate change uh, targets in, in, in the government. So, you know, there'll be a requirement for a continuous and sustained carbon reduction um, per train kilometre 
um, obviously aligned with appropriate uh, ScotRail franchise agreement targets uh, as well. So, um, and how do we monitor those uh, as well? So we know that the shift from road to rail in terms of the passengers is hugely important, but also we're putting a lot of work, um, investment uh, and conversations into freight uh, as well. So moving freight uh, from, from, from road to rail. And there's some exciting projects which are you know, very close to being materialised. Um, and if we can pull them off, uh, I think there'll almost be a kind of domino effect. And um, we're looking at a variety of sectors. Um, the two most exciting sectors, I have to say, on the freight side for me are on the whisky front and the timber front uh, as well. So these could hopefully help to, to, to uh, reduce our carbon emissions as well. So there will be you know, new emissions targets in, in the H law. So I can't obviously say what they are yet because we haven't published the document, but they will be there. Um, could we turn to deciding what railways should deliver? To me, a railway should deliver a good passenger experience, a seat to sit on, arrive in time for stopping at a station that I, as a passenger, want to get off at. The current consultation proposes the introduction of new ways of measuring rail performance, either replacing or supplementing the current public performance measure. What might these new measures be? and how would they be used in monitoring rail performance to give me a good passenger experience? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really good question because, you know, passengers will often say to me that, OK, you know, your PPM stats might be very high, but, you know, there's big frustration, for example, around skip stopping, I mean, you know, that, that you're talking about. And that is completely understandable why they would be frustrated. So uh, previous um, director of, of, of Scott Rail Alliance, uh, Phil Vester, uh, to credit to him, put a lot of effort into trying to reduce uh, skip stopping, uh, particularly during kind of peak times. But, you know, even if you reduce it to 1% to of trains, if you're on that 1% of train that's affected, you're going to be understandably miffed. So what I would say is a couple of things. One, I still think PPM is, is the right overall industry measure. Um, you know, that five minute uh, to, to, to destination uh, is important. Um, some people suggest, you know, moving to on, on time arrival, but, you know, that gives serious impacts to those with mobility issues. You know, there has to be some flexibility uh, around timing um, so that those, again, with mobility issues um, can get safely on and, and, and off a train. So I think PPM, generally speaking, is, is probably the right measure, but there's clearly a desire from the public for that to be supplemented or complemented. Um, so can we look at PPM not just at the end destination, but perhaps as the member suggests, at intermediate stations as well? Um, so the, the, the performance is measured. I think that's, that's important. Improving journey times is important as well. I think uh, the way to attract more people onto the rail and, uh, again, that would help with, with, with that modal shift would be to improve journey times. If there are other measures, because there are KPIs, of course, that, that are part of the ScotRail franchise, but if there are other measures, again, we're looking actively at them. And I think the main point that the member makes is, is absolutely the one that hits the nail on the head, that this has to be about the passenger experience rather than just numbers on a on a board. Any time I've travelled on, on, on railways, I've actually enjoyed it and... and uh, I hope to do that during the summer. Anyway, consultation indicates that the Scottish Government will review incentives for network rail to improve journey times, capacity and connectivity. Can you outline what the current incentives are, whether you think they're working and how might they be improved? Um, I mean, it's the role of, uh, and I'll look to officials just to keep me right here, but it is the, the, the role of the ORR to, dis to determine the, the kind of incentive framework um, for network rail as informed by the HLOS, both of the Scottish government and then the UK government. So uh, it's the, you know, and then the ORR's own extensive kind of cons consultation uh, process. Um, there's a number of incentives, outputs and metrics in place for control period five, but one area that I think, uh, alluding to the, the member's question, I mean, one area that I think really needs more focus in the next control period uh, is one that I've alluded to already is, is journey time improvements um, in particular those that can be those that can be secured by network rail working with the industry through pretty routine practices such as timetabling uh, better uh, timetable development and network renewal so we're likely I mean, again I don't want to prejudge the, the document before it comes out but we're likely to include um, a kind of requirement for uh, a regulated journey time output 
uh, in the H loss. So I think journey time improvements will attract more people to, to the railway. I think it's just common sense. Thank you. Um, final question then is to Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I want to ask a few questions about the RMTS, uh, the new uh, management system, um, which has, of course, been running for a few years now in the Cambrian uh, network, but uh, has yet to come to Scotland. I understand it's also going to GWR and London Crossrail. In particular, um, we would see benefits uh, in better capacity utilisation. But I wonder whether in particular it might be appropriate to consider introducing it north of Inverness where there are signalling issues uh, and where, like Cambrian, it's a relatively detached part of the network that could perhaps uh, pilot what, we've, uh, what we need to do. And of course, we've got one half of what we need for it. The GSMR uh, communication system is now more or less universal. Uh, is it time we uh, started to introduce this in Scotland? I can hear my, my director of rail to my left sighing heavily as you spoke, uh, Mr. Stevenson. I'm sure not uh, uh, for any personal reasons, but I think he, he, he might have something to say on this. So I'll, I'll hand over to him in just a second. But I, I think uh, from our experience of um, uh, the ERTMS, uh, uh, although the progress uh, or the uptake of it, development and implementation of it across uh, the UK and across Europe, generally has been actually quite slow. Um, as yet, uh, we don't believe that there's necessarily a robust business case for it and you know, what would be a potentially very significant investment in Scotland. Therefore, we wouldn't recommend it um, at this stage. However, we are working closely with Network Rail on further developing an appropriate signalling strategy for control period six. But um, I might just hand over to Bill Reeve if he wishes to supplement that um, answer. No. Not much more to add to that, Minister, other than, than to say that, that the European Rail Traffic Management System is a tantalising system because it, it takes the control of trains from drivers having to look at signals on the track and puts the, the, the authority to proceed at speed into the cab, which is, which is eminently sensible. But its track record of implementation has not been great to date, and I've lost track of the number of project managers around Europe I've talked to who have been tearing their hair out and crying into their beer over how long and how much it's taken. So. Uh, I think we maintain a close interest, uh, but it's a system that was designed originally for very high-speed lines, and a lot of the problems have been adaptation uh, of that technology for railways more like those we have in Scotland. So on Cambrian Line, after a lot of cost and a lot of time, it successfully introduced a signalling system which extended journey times and increased costs. So um, I'm not sure we want to rush to do that just yet. Uh, well, I understand the UK expects to implement it by 2044, so we're clearly not rushing in the GB network. Thank you, convener. Good. And, and I think that actually brings us to an end of our, our questions. Uh, is there, Minister, anything that you think we've missed that you'd like just to, to quickly sum up? I mean, I could, if there's anything. Uh, no, I mean, I'm trying to think of uh, if there's anything that hasn't been covered, but uh, I don't think so. I think uh, we didn't really go into, into, into freight as much as perhaps I um, uh, would like to, but, uh, you know, again, when the H loss is published and, uh, you know, uh, in future committee appearances, of course, I'd be happy to come back in and have a conversation around that. But, uh, no, I thank the members uh, for uh, their questions and their feedback, and uh, we are determined, of course, to publish the H loss by the statutory guide uh, date, the deadline, but hopefully before that, in fact, if we're able to do so. So if members have further comments that they wish to feed back, uh, the sooner the better would be helpful. Well, thank you, Minister. And, and just I'm sure that the public will be taking you up on, on, on the offer to receive letters on how things could coordinate better between the different types of transport. So, Minister, I'd like to thank you for your attending this morning. I'd also like to speak, thank Bill Reeve for, for attending and John Proven, who unfortunately didn't get to say anything, but thank you very much for attending and I'm briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow witnesses to change. Thank you.
Um, I'm going to reconvene the, the, the meeting now to take uh, agenda item two, which is on Presswick Airport, where we will receive an update on the progress of Glasgow Presswick Airport and its financial management. I'd like to welcome Andrew Miller, the Chair, uh, Ron Smith, the Chief Executive, and Derek Banks, the Financial and Commercial Director. Mr Miller, would you like to make a brief opening statement? I would. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'll keep it short. Um, I am the chairman of uh, TS uh, Holdings Limited and also the chair of the operating board of uh, Presswick. Uh, to my right, we have Mr. Ron Smith, as you said, the CEO, and to my left, Mr. Derek Banks, who's the finance and commercial director. This is our first appearance in front of uh, the Scottish Parliamentary Committee, and I'm pleased with the timing of this because it coincides with the launch of our five-year plan, which covers the years 2017 to 2022. It sets out the action that we're already taking to turn the business around to become a privately owned uh, but profitable and sustainable airport for generations to come. The document is based on a considerable amount of analysis and hard work and it articulates upon a significant amount of work that's already underway, uh, but the plan is credible and we feel comfortable that we can deliver. At the heart of our strategic plan is the determination not to see the, only to see the airport return to private ownership, but to drive to create uh, a long-term sustainable business for generations to come, and also playing a wider role in the Ayrshire economy and uh, the Scottish economy in general. The airport employs over 300 people and we facilitate a 365 day, 24 hour day operation at Presswick. And we further support 4,500 jobs in the region. A large proportion of these jobs being very high value in terms of average salary and GPA created. In 2014, Audit Scotland reported that the airport contributed to 61.1 million to the Scottish economy. Our strategic plan maps out how we can build on this significant contribution and increase employment opportunities within the region, but also to help the Scottish economy in areas of tourism, in terms of exports, and of course, uh, the aviation industry in general. We face a number of challenges. For example, there was a major reduction in passenger numbers from 1.1 million to 620, uh, 624,000 in 2014 and there had also been a lack of significant investment with the previous owners however we're working to address this under uh, spend of capital since joining the board i've been focused on bringing a team together with the knowledge and expertise and experience to, to, to uh, have good governance processes in place and to use our resources effectively and also to hand to harness the goodwill of the stakeholders and drive the business forward. It should be noted that under the direction of the board, the executive team have exceeded expectations on budgets each year for the last two years. And although the financial accounts as of the 31st of March 2017 are unaudited, it will show uh, that we've achieved a substantial reduction in our operating losses. The turnaround will, however, be challenging and it will take time, but it has started and we're moving in the right direction. We operate in a dyna dynamic and highly competitive environment. There are further unknowns ahead for us, like Brexit and, for instance, the out outcome of APD discussions. We take this into consideration in our plans and we believe that our strategic plan is measured and resilient. Glasgow Presswick Airport has a phenomenal amount of potential and we have a clear plan and we strongly believe that we could offer excellent value to potential investors. We have the most diverse service offering of any airport in Scotland, including passenger, fixed base operations, large scale and specialist cargo operations, aviation emergency receipt and in the future, hopefully, access to fl space flight. We offer a number of unique advantages. These include the only airport in Scotland, which has two runways, one of which is the longest in the country, which allows us to handle aircraft of any size. We have abundant land over 850 acres and the ability to adapt our operations as quickly as we can manage in terms of the future ahead. 
We're also the only airport that's accessible by rail directly to our door, providing easily affordable and sustainable access uh, to air travel and makes us the only airport that has fuel delivered by rail direct from the uh, refinery, which provides national aviation resilience. We operate 24 by 7 and we have the capacity available which ensures that Scotland does not have constraints in its ability to connect with the global market. We operate the airport on a commercial basis, arm's length from the government. However, we are cognizant of the fact that the lender is the public purse and the level of transparency and accountability that comes with that is critical to us. We welcome your questions and we'll endeavour to provide as much information as possible. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much. Um, there are quite a few questions on a, on a variety of uh, subjects um, and uh, they could move around the, the, whole, the whole remit that you cover. John is going to be the first person to start off. Uh, thanks very much, convener, and thank you very much for your opening statement uh, as well. I mean, could you give us a view, an overview of the performance of the airport since, I think, two years now since the Scottish government, uh, Scottish ministers bought it, um, and just to kind of feel for, you know, how it's done? I mean, you, you said that the losses are less than they used to be. Well, as an accountant, you know, I don't like hearing about losses anyway. So we're still making losses. What about passengers? What about freight over the last two years? Um, certainly in terms of performance over the last couple of years, um, they have been better than forecast, um, although there are still losses and significant losses within that. A uh, part of the issue, obviously, is the impairment of assets as we spend throughout the year. And I'll try and explain impairment, uh, if you bear with me. Um, normally, uh, you would depreciate the assets over the life of the asset, and that can range from anything from three years to 40 years, depending on what it is. But we actually have to write that off within the year. So that's roughly about £4 million a year, which is uh, exacerbating the losses or apparent losses. So I think if you're trying to compare them, it is quite difficult to do that, albeit that we can do it in, in terms of the adjusted EBITDA, which is uh, really looking at the operating losses. So those operating losses have come down, um, not significantly, but have pro been progressing downwards over the last couple of years. So is that the most positive thing that has happened, is that we're making less loss than we used to? I think because of the challenging environment we're in, we're always going to find it difficult. And we're looking at everything we can do to reduce costs, but also increase the income. For instance, um, over the last three years, military income has increased by 37%. Uh, the property is, is now, um, in terms of occupancy, going from 58% a couple of years ago to 95%. Um, cargo is still a struggle. It's, it's, it's maintained its levels, but it's not improving. Um, but over every income stream, we are slowly progressing. In terms of passenger numbers, um, we had a drop from the 1.1 million down to 624,000. That increased to 678,000 uh, just last year, and we're projecting forward to about 710,000 for, for this year. Thank you. I mean, I think some of my colleagues will ask more detail about cargo and, and passengers and so on. So the final one for me would be, uh, can you just explain about the board? And I understand there's two boards and, and how that works and who does what. Um, the, um, I'll answer that question if I may. The two boards were created to uh, uh, keep uh, the stakeholder, at, uh, the shareholder at arm's length uh, because of EU rules and because of state aid rules. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, followed the model that was undertaken at Cardiff when the Welsh Government uh, took ownership of Cardiff Airport and uh, there was some good work done there that the Scottish Government uh, decided to follow to keep the business at arm's length. So the whole call uh, represents uh, the, the shareholder, uh, which is the Scottish Government, uh, which has two civil servants, myself and Ron, on the board. Uh, they deal with the long-term strategic direction of the business and make sure that the business adhering to the financial plans uh, that, that it has. At the operating level, we have all the functions covered as a normal board and with uh, the non-executive directors who have the correct experience at that board, and I chair both boards. So it's a compliance issue from an EU perspective and from a state aid perspective. Okay, thank you. That needs neatly on to Peter. Yeah, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my question is about uh, the new strategic plan. I mean, I, the, 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 the real question is why was a new strategic plan required, given that the last one was only published in late 2014, and how do the two documents differ? 
That's a very good question, and I think it's worth noting that uh, with the tremendous reduction in, in passenger numbers that fell very quickly around that time, uh, I think we all realised that there was a necessity to, to actually take a far more realistic view about the new numbers uh, and go into a reset position which we're coming off a very realistic base. I think it was also the view of the non-executive team and the executive team that a new realistic forward look at all of our aspects of growth, all of our revenue streams should be attacked and that we would set a new strategy gain, gain, uh, geared very heavily at actually trying to win more business across all of our revenue streams. So the, the new team put together a new plan with a highly realistic basis, with a highly uh, refined, refined focus on what was achievable and with a view to actually driving the revenue streams to get us into profitability for the long term. Fantastic document, given that you, you know we've seen the uh, freight uh, tonnage drop, we've seen passenger numbers drop, we've seen the uh, number of aircraft movements drop. Um, so really, that was what drove the new the new uh, the new plan. Yeah, the original plan, for instance, had 1.1 million passengers, uh, which was the running rate uh, at the beginning of 2014. When I joined the business on the 1st of December uh, that year, the running rate was 620,000 passengers, roughly. So we had to reset the business, both in terms of uh, the future think, but also in terms of cost control as well. As Ron said, reset. Mm. So I'm assuming from that that, that uh, you know, the, uh, the question would be what progress was made in meeting the goals set out in the origi original strategic plan. And I suppose the answer to that, that they, they, they weren't being met at all. In, in other words, they were going the wrong way. Yeah. So uh, I would characterise it as the, uh, the patient was bleeding and we had to stabilise the patient. So the reset was a stabilisation of the business, given the change in economic factors. Uh, that were driving uh, the issue of the falling numbers. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and as a follow-up to that, you, you are saying how difficult things are. Uh, in, in some of our papers, it says that the, the capital plan does not include the cost of replacing the existing primary radar, which must be done within the next five years. Um, so how, how much was, is that likely to cost, and how are, you, how are you proposing that you will be able to finance that if that's something that vitally needs to be done in a fairly short timescale? Can I take that one? Yes. Yeah. yes sir. In terms of the radar, we've actually started implementation of the radar. So the tower has been built and the equipment is now uh, being tested. Um, and that has been primarily funded by the wind farm development funds, uh, which we have to maintain that radar for the next 25 years in, in terms of recognising those funds. So we, uh, if anything goes wrong with it, we have to then maintain or repair or replace that. So that, that's been funded by wind farms. Uh, so you're well on the way to replacing that? It will be operational, I think, by later this year. Okay. So can you just clarify, I'm sorry, a bit confused. Is that, is that from a community wind farm fund or is that from a wind farm that, that, that you own yourself? No, it's wind farm developers. So it's a development fund that, that, that wind farmers have paid into? Yes. Yeah, yes. wind farms come with a risk in terms of radar, in terms of the old technology. Okay. And the turning blades stop the radar working to track aircraft. Okay. And sorry, could you just give me an indication of how much that actually was? Just because I think people would want to know how much was contributed. In, in terms of the contribution or the cost of the radar? The cost of the radar. The cost of the radar, I think, I believe is about 3.2 million. 3.2. Sorry, Stuart. Okay. Um, thank you. Do you Okay. Um, I, I have, sorry, a question which I'd just like to ask about staff, if it's may. Um, there's been a series of, of senior staff changes at the airport since 2014. Um, do you think the, that's going to have a positive effect or a negative effect on performance and, and returning to profitability in 22-23? Well, you've got to consider that, you know, when I joined the business that, um, you know, early question about the numbers surrounding the 2014 plan and the current performance, uh, we had to make some changes at the senior level to put the right people in the right slots, and uh, we made some changes. Uh, the, uh, some of the people concerned had contractual uh, you know, contracts from the previous owner, and we had to fulfil the legal obligations within uh, these, these contracts. Um, Richard, I think yours is the next question. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, if the convener will allow me, I'd like to set the scene before I ask my questions. I live in Motherwell. 
Um, I travelled to I've travelled to Presswick on several occasions to pick up relations. Uh, excellent uh, journey time, excellent roads, excellent rail, excellent airport. The only problem was when I arrived at half past ten, eleven o'clock at night, I was the only person in that airport apart from the staff waiting on my relations. Other people then arrived about 11 o'clock, so I think the flight, I was very early. I got there earlier because of the excellent, I got there earlier because of the excellent travelling uh, uh, roads and rail, you know, to, to your area. So why is it that such an excellent airport, and I remember actually flying out of your airport a number of years ago, going to America, why is it you have lost so much of uh, airlines, you know, I think there's only a few flights a day, one flight at night, you know, three, four flights a day, uh, going into Presswick. I think it's a, it's a national scandal that an airport such as good as yours, with e all those excellent things that are going for it, is not vibrant as much as I was in Glasgow on Sunday and that was bursting at the seams, taking my son to, to he was flying out somewhere. So why is it that, um, you know, the last time, when was the last time a new scheduled passenger airline chose to operate from Presswick? And why is it proven to be so difficult to get people to come? And, and I mean, it's a fantastic airport. Why is it so difficult to get air, airline uh, people to come to your airport? Uh, if I'd like to take that one, please. Um, it's a very good question, and in fact, it's something that has been at the root of my whole thought process since joining the business. Um, we certainly understand that, you know, from the, the good old days, and let me just say that the good old days, at its maximum, the airport would still fall under the classification that the CAA put on small airports, because at 1.2 million passengers or 2.4 million passengers in its heyday, that would still be regarded as a small airport. We've lost some business there because of strategic um, plans with some of the airlines. Some people, have, uh, Ryanair is a good example where they wanted to move, uh, and keep in mind they are the largest people mover in Europe these days. They, they've part of their evolution, they now see themselves as competing with a different set of competitors. They see themselves as challenging the major airlines these days and want to be alongside the major, major airlines in many cases. So we've worked hard with Ryanair, certainly within the last few years, about getting alongside them to stop any further erosion of, of their passenger numbers, in fact, to restart building passenger numbers with that airline to some degree of success, as, as Derek alluded to earlier. Uh, but that's not the end of the story. We are working very hard now with, uh, with a whole raft of airlines that we've identified where we can offer something fairly unique in terms of capacity, in terms of time slots, in terms of ease of access to Glasgow and the rest of the, of, of the southwest of Scotland, uh, and even into northern England uh, in terms of the, the Lake District. So that's the type of approach we're making, and we're looking towards airlines and routes that currently don't exist in Scotland, or certainly in the west of Scotland, to try and offer that uniqueness that we can handle and give the capacity and the excellent service levels that these people would actually uh, expect from us. A lot of the problem comes from the history. You know, the days of British Airways and the transatlantic and the war dares and some of the people that you probably refer to going to the US and Canada, um, they're no longer with us. There's a new generation of operators. Low cost is now the dominant factor in airline development. We know it takes around 18 months to 36 months to get a passenger airline committed to a route and an awful lot of work in between times to massage it across the line. And that's exactly what we're doing now. We have a number of very strong possibilities for new routes and new airlines, and that's exactly what we're following up on. And our plan takes a conservative but realistic view of how much of that business we expect to land. How confident are you securing new, new airlines, and how important is this in meeting the objectives of the strategic plan? At the end of the day, you know, I think you only, Ryanair only flies to Barcelona. <laughs> are, they, are, they, are they doing other, other, other ones? You know, there, there are more other um, areas that people, you know, you could open up your, your airlines to. And how, how much are you sitting down to talk to airlines and, and convince them to come to Presswick? Because I think it's a really excellent airport. 
right? And I'll compliment you on it. But really, I think we've got to get our finger out and get something done about it. Well, if you read the forward of the strategic plan, my own forward, you'll see that the first thing I identified when I took on this role was the fact that we were not putting enough effort into winning new business. And that's really where I made some major changes to the structure of the organisation to bring in specialists in passenger development, route development manager, in cargo and freight development, in FBO and military type business. We now have people managing those revenue streams and attracting new business that are the lifeblood of the airport and are the biggest part of the strategic plan. Uh, page number, I'll just refer to it, page number 25 of the strategic plan here shows all the destinations we fly to. And actually we have one or two exclusive destinations that we serve from, uh, from Glasgow Presswick that don't actually, uh, are not actually served from other, other airports in Scotland. So we are making that progress. We've got along far closer alongside Ryanair than possibly we've ever been. And we are now very, very close with a number of other airlines on these new routes. Sadly, because of the very strong commercial restraints put on us with these negotiations, um, it would be very unwise of me to actually give any further details on the, who we're talking to, because the easiest way to lose a new route is for that type of information to enter the public domain and actually scare the airline or perhaps the shareholders many of them are PLCs and it could actually have an effect on the stock value. So we can, and I'd be delighted to come back to this committee and give further details, we can actually, uh, uh, when we can, and then we can certainly give the full details of, of the successes that we've achieved uh, over the last 12 months or the next time we actually sit in front of the committee. But, but it is true, Ron, that uh, Ryanair announced a new route uh, to Poland uh, yeah, so like two weeks ago. It's yeah. to the city of Ryskjof in southeastern Poland. Uh, it has been booking remarkably well. It's a fantastic uh, setup there because not only is it a, a high point of aviation engineering in, in Poland, and it'll match very nicely with our aviation manufacturing business in Scotland, but it's about 100 kilometres uh, from, the from the border with, uh, with Ukraine, and it's about 80 kilometres from the border with uh, Slovakia, and we know that already some of those bookings are to the citizens of those countries who are using that as the entry point. Uh, into the UK and through Glasgow Press Week. So it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity to show Ryanair exactly what we can do when we're given that type of opportunity. Uh, so just last question, it's only Ryanair that fly out of Press Week or, or is there more? It's the only scheduled carrier that flies from Press Week today, but we do have other services that fly from Yeah, I, I, I know you've it's got other... It's only scheduled, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, okay. I'll, be, I'll be in your airport in a couple of weeks' time. I'll be picking up the relations again. I Fine. may see you around. Thanks. Good, good yeah, yeah, Derek, if you can, there's a few questions piling up on the back just, of that. So. Just very quickly, um, in terms of the, the airline traffic as well, obviously it takes a length of time to actually get that business in, anything from 18 months to 36 months. So we're not sitting back waiting you know, for that to happen, we're actually being active and in, in progressing other income streams as well. So. Okay. And, and uh, Rod, I think we all appreciate that the last thing this committee wants to do is frighten uh, potential customers away. So Jamie's going to come in uh, with a question on the back of that. Thank you, Convener. I appreciate that uh, many of these discussions are sensitive uh, commercial discussions. But in the Audit Scotland uh, report from 2015, it, it did state that the airport really isn't viable without Ryanair. Now, I come from a commercial background, and that sounds to me like a tremendous risk to a business when it has pretty much a sole customer who's uh, essential for the success of the business. Um, my experience of uh, Ryanair falling out with airports, I've seen it happen in other parts of Europe. For example, I recall when they pulled out of the Granada route for, from the UK and the devastation that had on the local uh, tourist industry and, and the, the local economy. What are you doing to address the fact that this is such a huge risk that you have a sole airline who is perhaps somewhat notorious for, for, for falling out with airports? Um, uh, You're going to answer that tactfully. <laughs> yes, I think uh, that uh, Ryanair are a hugely successful airline, albeit an unusual one. Um, one point that's very worth uh, while making is that Ryanair um, started its, its overseas business at Glasgow Press Week when it was still a very fledgling airline. Uh, and as part of that uh, launch into the UK, uh, it established its um, very, it's, it's only in fact heavy maintenance base at Presswick, which it has since expanded and which and we're in discussions with them again about further expanding. 
So the commitment to Presswick is, is very strong. Is it 350, 300 jobs at the Ryanair maintenance facility, uh, plus a, a very high number of, of, of apprentices employed in that uh, maintenance and overhaul operation, which, as I said earlier, is the only one of its type anywhere in the Ryanair network. So the fact that we're, we're having this discussion with them about further expansion and the creation of more jobs, I think, is a very strong indicator to the fact that they see a future for the Presswick facility. And it also means that every single Ryanair aircraft in their fleet, which is rapidly expanding, uh, comes to Presswick for heavy maintenance and sea check overhaul. So there's a very strong bond there, assisted by a whole new attitude to, from the senior management team and the executive team at uh, Glasgow Presswick these days in terms of working alongside Ryanair. You know, it was a long time when there was a, a vacuum and uh, we've certainly plugged that vacuum and we now have a very strong working relationship with the senior team in Dublin at Ryanair. Stuart, did you want to come just in on quickie. that? Um, flying these days commercially is the most miserable experience on earth. And it's all down to airports. Um, when I started flying uh, 50 years ago, you parked at the front of the airport, you were in the air 20 minutes later. And the hassle was almost nil. Is that a huge advantage that Presswick have in terms of relatively small throughput at the moment and relatively capacious uh, facilities? We've talked about airlines. How are we energising passengers to demand services from what's actually? Let me be as good as I can a relatively stress-free departure experience. Uh, it's a good point you raise. Obviously, uh, costs associated with compliance, for instance, security-related issues, have fundamentally changed. And they, are, uh, they work against a uh, uh, calm uh, passenger experience. Uh, but that's legislated. Uh, but I, I do take your point. Uh, the other areas is over, are obviously uh, the retail experience or the spent-per-head experience that all the airports are actually um, trying to achieve. Uh, because uh, it's the best way of making the airport profitable. When the airport at Presswick was designed, uh, the passenger processes, and we'll get on to your point, the passenger processes were completely different in the 60s than they are today. You had paper tickets, right? And the allocation between airside and landside, it was 70% landside, counting the paper tickets, checking in the bag checking passports, no, no technology. And where we are today, which is the exact opposite, all the space has to be airside because that's where you make the most money. And fortunately, in the history of Presswick Airport, that dynamic in terms of switch of land allocation within the building hasn't taken place. And it's one of the projects that Ron and his team are working on in terms of what we, we do if we have more money in terms of our increasing profitability and how we address that uh, that significant problem. Now, the USP we do have is we're very quiet and we can give a very hands-on experience to the passenger. Uh, the downside is to achieve that, we have to create an environment that's conducive uh, to get that good passenger experience, but at the same time be very careful in how we spend our money. Now, the management team do have plans in how we can address that, but it's very much we perform and we get more money. And that's exactly what we've been doing. So we have had generalised upgrades in the building, but it's a very good point you do raise. It's not a comfortable experience. Okay. Not at Presswick. It's a very good experience at Presswick. I mean, at other airports. Um, John, I think you've got the next question. Thank, thanks again, convener. Um, I mean, I do realise you, you answered um, Mr Lyle, and uh, you can't say too much about detailed routes and all that kind of thing, but uh, I think in the strategic plan it did specifically mention London as you'd be hoping to get a, um, a route there at some point again. Can you give us any comment on that at all? Yes, I'd be delighted to. Um, London is a vital uh, hub for any airport in the UK, and, and we are working very, uh, f very hard and with a great deal of focus, prime focus, and making London a priority. Now, London is served by many airports, and we would have a preference of which one we would like to establish a route with, but we are working tirelessly to try and establish that London connection to serve the people of the west of Scotland uh, with an alternative and to give uh, the, 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 the local uh, catchment area uh, a direct connection to the world. People use an airport when it has a flight going to where you want to go to, 
or if it goes to a hub that you can transfer to where you want to go to. And that transfer connectivity is vital to us. And there's no better place in the UK to have that with us than in London. So we're working tirelessly with a number of the airports in London to set that up. And we have uh, conducted some modifications and, and improvements to uh, both landside and airside infrastructure at the airport to cater for a domestic route or routes once we can actually get one over the line. But it's certainly our prime focus it is UK domestic connectivity through London and also European and long haul connectivity through other airports uh, and airlines we're targeting uh, around Europe and in North America in particular. So all of that is important, but London still remains our prime focus uh, as a UK connecting hub. I mean, to be slight, oh, sorry. If, before you move on to the next question. Well, I, I was going to, can I ask something else on that? Yes, absolutely, and then, and then I'll bring John okay. Finney in and then bring you back. That's in great, okay. Um, I mean, to be slightly devil's advocate then, I mean, we've got three airports in the centre of Scotland, Central Belt. Um, you know, why would I as a passenger want to go to Prestwick when I've, I've got Glasgow and uh, Edinburgh? Why would an airline want to go to Prestwick when it's got Glasgow and Edinburgh, um, which are closer to the population, both have either got or about to get rail links? Um, you know, what, what is, uh, is there anything unique about Prestwick that you can offer? Ron was talking about the, uh, the, the, the market in terms of de demand. The CA stats say that the London catchment area is the biggest market available to the natural catchment area of Presswick, which is about, which is basically, is Presswick your nearest airport? So we're talking about the natural catchment area. And we know it's over 200,000 packs a year bypass Presswick. Uh, to get to another airport to travel to London. They'd prefer not to do that. Mm -hmm. It's about us securing an airline that uh, sees that opportunity, which may or may not have duplicated assets in uh, the other two airport locations that you allude to, but to try and cut down uh, the travel time, carbon footprint, etc. cetera. Uh, that's all part and parcel of the uh, analysis. Uh, just... Well, can I just bring John in, and then it, it may, it may, Ron, tie into the answer that you're going to give. And uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. <clears throat> it was October last year that the, the Scottish government very enthusiastically lent their support to a third runway at at, uh, at Heathrow. Uh, they were positively salivating about all the benefits that would come to Scotland from that. I have the press release here, and. Uh, um, we will now work with both Heathrow and the UK government to ensure commitments made to Scotland are followed through. Now, one of these commitments uh, was in relation to, I quote here, the potential for a logistic hub to be based at Presburg Airport is also an important part of the Heathrow offer. Can you outline what discussions you've had with the Scottish government around this particular uh, aspect of um, the work, please? Yes, uh, in fact, there is a photograph inside the strategic plan of the very incident of the signing of that MOU, which took place at Glasgow Presswick Airport. Um, it's a commercial understanding that Heathrow will set up a number of supply hubs to support the construction of the new runway, the new North, uh, Northern Runway, and also some of its additional uh, terminal requirements with the extension of Terminal 2 and further satellites of it. Um, they learned, I think, within the construction of Terminal 5, that uh, that's a very congesting type operation. And in order to meet some of the lessons learned in that, uh, in that, in that issue, uh, the supply hub approach is something they're looking at in terms of spreading the supply chain around the UK to get better value for money and also to reduce congestion by bringing uh, componentry for the construction process in using alternative methods. So we, we are certainly very much part of that. We were very early contenders in terms of talking to Heathrow at a very high level. We had a stakeholder review with them in terms of the local stakeholders in South Asia. And we have been to several events whereby we have followed on that interest uh, as part of the process. So we see this as something that we are complying with. We're working closely with the government in terms of following that uh, opportunity. It, only suggests in the MOU that it should be a supply support hub in Scotland. Presswick Airport would be 
in our opinion, an ideal location for that, and it seems that Heathrow share that view. However, we're not the only bidding party, uh, but we are in a strong position, we believe, and will continue to drive this process to allow us to be uh, a very suitable candidate in the selection of a supply hub for Scotland that has been uh, guaranteed as part of the MOU. Do you want to give us some more details on that, Derek, in terms of the... I mean, and then John, I think, has got to follow up. Yep, just, just very briefly, in terms of the process that we're having to go through, we have to register an interest by 31st of July. So we're currently working with stakeholders, including South Ayrshire Council and Scottish Enterprise, to you know, get a bid together that's credible. Uh, and as Ron says, you know, press is one of the options, uh, but a very strong option in terms of our linkage with, with both marine, rail and air travel and road travel. So actually, as a logistics hub, it does make a lot, a lot of sense to be there. You maybe don't. Well, but perhaps you'll sense my, my cynicism about the, the, the whole project. It, it's predicated on the assumption that a, a third one way would go ahead. Can you say what, what prominence you give the potential in your future projections for, for, for business? Because it would, uh, in my opinion, be wrong to put too much emphasis on it. Nothing. There's nothing in the five-year plan of this document, although the MOU does talk about preferred access and slot access for any Scottish airport into that new facility. And I do understand it's not a, not a done deal, uh, but you know all these big projects you've got to plan well, uh, well in advance. So, but there's nothing in our five-year plan in that regard, other than we see the opportunity to provide the prefabrication hub, as Ron mentioned, for air, sea and road and rail, because Presswick is very near a very important rail act as well. Okay. Granted, a, a further supplementary, um, a very busy schedule. Can, can I ask, uh, and I may have noted you uh, incorrectly, but in relation to military income, 38%, is that 38% of the income or an increase of 38%, which military and what do they get? in terms of the income generated. So it has increased by 38% over the last three years. Um, unfortunately, we, we can't divulge the, the, the flights that go in and out of uh, Presswick from a military point of view. Okay. Are, are you cooperating fully with authorities on the issue of rendition, albeit that that is a, perhaps from your perspective, a historic matter? John, I, I think can we... Can, uh, I think Derek has given you a sort of undertaking that he can't really discuss it. I, I, I understand your point. I mean, if, Derek, if you're uncomfortable answering any further than you would... I'm, I'm happy. I would say as the chair that uh, we, uh, we uh, all military aircraft, including civil aircraft, have got to comply with CEA and Department of Transport rules. And uh, any aircraft that complies with these rules can fly to any airport in the UK. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I'm not sure you, you, you maybe could follow that up with, with, with the minister. Uh, if you want to, John, I think your next question. Very much. Yes, my other question was kind of in the area of freight, and I understand from the strategic plan that uh, really the freight market has changed quite a lot in recent years. So I just wonder if you could explain that to us and how that's an advantage or a disadvantage. Okay, the freight market that uh, we talk about at Presswick is uh, the market for dedicated freight. That is, aircraft that are built or converted simply to become freighters and carry specialist freight and cargo. Um, that market is probably in long-term decline. We, we can sense it. But we have a plan to cut ourselves a much bigger slice of the market by offering these very specialist services that are unique to Scotland at Glasgow Presswick. I'm talking about experience in terms of ground handling services, in terms of their e equipment to load very unusual and heavy cargo, and, and the ability to turn around very large freight aircraft such as 747s and 777 freighters. Um, the bulk of the freight market which is booming is coming in the form of belly hold freight, which is basically the freight that's carried in the hold of a passenger aircraft, mostly flying long haul. So Heathrow's, for example, Heathrow's rapidly expanding freight business is due to the massive capacity it has for aircraft with belly hold going all over the world and carrying freight with it almost as a byproduct. The low-cost carriers don't like to use freight as an income stream because it slows down their turnarounds. And the whole of the low-cost aircraft industry or airline industry is based on the, 
flying hours of the aircraft, maximising the hours in the sky, and the last thing they want is to reduce the turnaround, or sorry, to increase the turnaround time, reduce the flying time by taking on freight. So, as part of our new um, business focus of winning new airlines, passenger airlines, we are actually picking very closely some targets that would be very interested in, in carrying belly hold as a targeted market. And we know who these airlines are. They probably have dedicated free business themselves, but are swinging more on to belly hold. And these are the type of knock-on effects that we see as, uh, as good passenger development. But we're also following up some airlines, passenger airlines, just because we can offer them a specialist freight facility as part of their belly hold program. So it's not as simple as it might seem, but we are trying to cover both markets by A, attracting new airlines that would be interested in belly hold freight, and secondly, by cutting ourselves a much larger slice of the traditional dedicated freighter market. Just the one supplementary, if that's all right. Um, I mean, I think food exports would be a, bit, a big thing for Scotland, and we're hoping to expand that further. Is that the kind of area that you're looking at where it has to move very quickly to another market? Anything high value with a, with a shelf life uh, is got to be the main target, and a prime Scottish export that meets those criteria is seafood and salmon. Um, and these are the types of markets where we're looking at. We have opened up some dialogue with Food and Drink Scotland about you know, the potential to actually have specialist facilities and really tap into that market. It's currently uh, handled by road, excessive road transport down from Scotland to Heathrow, where very often it's exported right over the top of press as way to North America. So we have analysed the market and the potential, and we're trying to tap into it. Um, Jamie, this is the next question. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I should start uh, before I pose my question that I express my support for the many local jobs that Presswick Airport creates across the west of Scotland as a West Scotland member and particularly in Ayrshire. Um, I think there's no doubt there is a lot of goodwill uh, across the country to see the airport succeed and grow successfully but naturally uh, to do so in the best value of the public funding that it's receiving. Um, I have a specific question around uh, Presswick as a spaceport. Now, we've heard quite a lot about that uh, in the recent months and, and indeed years, and it does uh, raise its head often, but very little detail is known around it, I think, uh, or awareness of where we are at with the potential of using Presswick as a sp spaceport. I wonder if the panel might want to elaborate on where we're at with discussions, uh, who's making decisions on this, um, the, the sort of numbers involved, etc. Yeah. Um, certainly. Can I just uh, ask you to be, to be as brief and focused o on it as possible? I'll, I'll try my best, Commissioner. Thank you. In, in terms of the process, um, we commissioned a report uh, a couple of years ago um, to, to look at the feasibility of developing uh, Presswick as a spaceport. Um, that, that feasibility study came back with figures in terms of the development costs to take that forward. And in that, um, we have been given a, a, an estimate of about £5 million to build the infrastructure required for the first launch uh, with one operator. Um, now, that, that is, is a relatively low sum of money in terms of developing a spaceport, um, and, and therefore we, we do believe it's a, a viable option to go forward. The, the, the issues we've now got is obviously it's a matter for the UK government in terms of taking that forward and in terms of um, the, the funding requirements as well. We have submitted five applications to the recent UK Space Agency um, funding route. Unfortunately, that's uh, been delayed because of PURDA uh, in terms of the general election. But we are hopeful that um, at least one of those applications will go forward. Now, obviously, I can't talk, to, talk too much about it because it is commercially sensitive in terms of those bids because it includes the operator's costs as well and income levels. Uh, is this space tourism or what, what type of uh, no, uses? Uh, just to, uh, to answer that question, it's, uh, it's, it always gets in the papers that way, but the real demand is satellite launches for GPS application. The market's growing three, four times a year. We have a very major manufacturer in Glasgow in terms of Clydesat. All the satellite manufacturers have got to truck the goods to Eastern Europe in the main and wait on the space to go up on a vertical launch. This is a horizontal launch with a pod that goes up to about 55,000 feet and launches the pod that way. Phenomenal reduction of cost, but also phenomenal demand. So what, we're, what the satellite industry say to us, we are looking for a low-cost launch facility like a low-cost airline. So the £5 million that's required in, in, in capital investment to allow this to happen, uh, is that money that you are applying for from UK government, from the Space Agency, 
from the Scottish Government. It's, I'm unsure as to where that money will come from. We have put in submissions to the UK Space Agency programme to try and uh, recover some of that money. Okay, thank you. I'll move on uh, very quickly and briefly to uh, some of the other sources of revenue that, that you have, uh, such as fixed base, business aviation, uh, and indeed military. Uh, how do you uh, plan to grow those revenues? Um, that's an excellent question. It's part of the overall growth process. Um, military is a very good example of something that can happen quickly. I, I, I said earlier that, that gaining new passenger routes can take anywhere between 18 and 36 months. Military business winning can be substantially shorter than that. It can, it can be days, it can be weeks. And in fact, we found that our new business development uh, manager for fixed base operations, which includes military, uh, has actually been in North America talking to some potential customers and the flights he's managed to win have actually landed at Presswick before his return. So it's a much shorter uh, lead time in terms of winning that business. And, and some of the figures that Derek told in terms of the improvement in the earnings from military reflect that. So we'll continue to work on, on, on the military side on that basis. It's all about contacts. It's all about meeting people. It's all about re reassuring people that we have in place the ground services, the technical capability, and the fueling capability that attracts that type of business. Good example of that would be us working very closely with the hydro uh, entertainment facility. We had a star, I won't mention the name, but uh, uh, we had uh, four, five 747 aircraft, freight aircraft, that were dedicated to a two-night performance at the Scottish Hydro. Now, previously, that business would have gone to another airport down south. We worked tirelessly with the hydro management team to secure these aircraft, one of which was for costumes only uh, for that period of time. So it's a very good example of how we've improved the revenue streams uh, through better business development processes. Very helpful, thank you. Um, Richard, you've got the next question. I'll try and be brief. I, uh, I've got an additional. Um, you mentioned service, uh, Ryanair service uh, facility in Presswick. Can you not interest other uh, companies to come in to bring in, you know, you've got long runways, Two runways, can you get other people to come and service the planes at Presswick? That was certainly very much part of our ambitions at the, at the, certainly at the start of the last year. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that we have been very successful in doing that. We've attracted the uh, very well-known uh, aer aerospace uh, maintenance and overhaul organisation Chevron into what was our largest hire, vacant hire facility at Glasgow Presswick. Uh, it was vacant for a long number of years, 10 years I believe. Uh, we were paying rates on an empty property and now we have no rates to pay and a tenant actually paying us rent. So the swing has been enormous. We are certainly putting more and more of that infrastructure developed into focusing on um, maintenance, repair and overhaul to drive that income stream that we see is very good. And we do have a natural attraction for airlines based on the fact that Presswick has a long history of aviation maintenance uh, and manufacturing, if you go far back far enough, and that really is a very big interest to the aircraft, to airlines in terms of their maintenance programmes, and that's certainly part, part of our focus. Right, can we come on? Just the last question: passenger numbers. Ryanair uh, had expected to carry uh, 675,000 passengers from Presswick 2017, but my calculation that's over 13,000 people a week. Yet the new strategic plan predicts. 710,000 passengers, which is nearly like 700 people per week. OK, it's only equivalent to maybe possible, depending on the size of the plane, two, two extra planes. Why the, why the difference between what you're predicting and what Ryanair predict? Why are we getting the difference? In terms of Ryanair prediction, that was for 1617, uh, the 675,000. We actually achieved 678,000. Uh, the 710 is actually for, for this financial year. So you're predicting, because you're, you're bringing on this new route to Poland, uh, you're going to predict, plus the fact that you've got all these extra slots that other airports don't have. It's a bit like the beer advert. Um, could reach other places that other people can't. So you're predicting you can do better this year. Yeah, we, we, we will take any activity that Ryanair would wish to give us, uh, in addition to all the other airlines we're approaching as well. So the, the, the communication and, and conversations we're having with other airlines is really positive and, and progressing well. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Richard. The next question is Ryder. Thank you. 
Um, the strategic plan talks about harmonising pay and conditions for staff. What impact is this going to have on staff salary and conditions? That's a very good question. I, I, I can tell you it's a very good question indeed. Um, the situation uh, at all airports is quite complex in terms of the number of, of positions in the salary spine. Anyway. The one we have at Glasgow Press Week was particularly complicated. Uh, it's been operating on uh, the national living wage standard for some of these levels for some time. Um, we're trying now to simplify that. We have a process just launched that will actually uh, simplify and make the, uh, the salary scales far more transparent. Uh, we're looking at uh, taking in, on board all of the, uh, the pledges that are required under the, the Scottish Government's ideals. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but what we want to try and do is, is, is get a very clear, a very uh, structured uh, salary spine that everyone fits into and everyone can see where they fit into. We've taken um, a very um, strong uh, programme where we've actually had what we've called our internal roadshow. Uh, Glasgow Press makes a very big site. And we've taken, the management team have actually gone out to various parts of it and presented what we're trying to do uh, in consult, consultation with our staff and our unions to make sure they understand exactly what we're trying to do to get everyone into a far more simplified system and move everyone forward. It is our objective to move to the Scottish living wage, but because of the complexity, that's going to take some time. But we're sharing that uh, as part of our engagement process with our staff and our unions and making good headway with it. So it's something we see as vital. It is complicated, it will take us time. We are trying to make sure that we have the amount of um, funding available to, to cover that without spending any more money from the public purse. And that itself is a complexity because to move today to the Scottish living wage would be a sum of money that we just simply can't afford. But our staff understand that. They understand that we are funded by the public purse and we have a very strong communication programme with them as part of our staff engagement policy to make sure that everyone knows what's going on and, we're, and the fact we're trying to move to this within the next three years. So it's not going to mean any uh, wage cuts for staff, given that you know, a lot of the support for the airport is about its economic uh, impact on the local community and take-home wages is very much part of that. We understand that very clearly, naturally. And of course, as I said, a lot of our staff are already on the UK uh, living wage and therefore cutting it would not be an option. So we, we, we are trying to get better efficiencies from our staff. We're starting to look at any savings we can make from our employment costs, but certainly any move to reduce salaries or to reduce contracts to zero hours or that type of thing is not something we're looking at. We want to be a good employer and we want to be a model around, but within our affordability within the, within the public sector. We're going to now move, uh, I think, more into Derek's uh, thing on, on finances. Um, Mike. Thank you, Convener. Um, very interesting to hear what's being said and the information that we've got here, but I have to say, uh, I'm focusing on the airport, as we've already heard, is not viable without Ryanair. Ryanair are expanding their routes from Edinburgh. Um, flights are down, passenger numbers are down, <coughs> freight is down. That's the information that we've got here. And Mr. Smith said earlier on that passengers want to fly from where they want to go. I mean, it, 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 you've got to be where the passengers want to be. And with other airports expanding, isn't it simply, I have to ask a fundamental question, isn't it simply that the airport is in the wrong place to attract new business, whether it's passengers or whether it's airlines? And I actually think it's depressing reading, quite frankly. And um, my question is therefore focused on the finance. As a taxpayer, when will we ever get the money that has been invested in your company back? Just clarifying some, some of the issues there in terms of the numbers. In fact, passenger numbers are growing, and it has been growing for the last couple of years. Uh, in terms of freight, it has stabilised. It hasn't it, from one point or It million. has, but in, since, since government ownership, it has actually increased uh, from 624 up to predicted 710 for this year. Uh, uh, cargo numbers is static. It's around about 11,500 tonnes per, per year um, over the last couple of years. Um, so we, we are doing as much as we can to turn around the business and we're looking at every opportunity within that to look at our different income streams. Um, for instance, in terms of property, uh, that actually accounts for almost 20% of our income. Passengers and the, the indirect impact on passengers only accounts for 33% at this point in time. So a large part of our business is around other income streams and that's where we're trying to grow. So we're growing them all at the same time. 
Some are being more challenging that than doesn't, others. That doesn't agree with, the, the, I have to say, the private papers that have been given to us about annual passenger numbers in the millions have fallen, annual air transport movements have fallen, annual freight handle has plummeted from, from a few years ago. It just doesn't... I'm not confident that we're going to get our money back. Yeah. I, I can confirm that the passenger numbers have increased and the cargo numbers have stabilised over the last couple of years. And I'd be happy to write the figures to you. Well, if you can provide more figures than, than, than we've got. Well, certainly the, the graphs that we've been produced show, uh, as Mike is suggesting, that transport movements ha have decreased. I think passenger numbers would be... Would be, a, would be it's difficult to tell exactly from the graph, but it, 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 it's just above a flat line, but, it, but it's not much more than that. And, and freight handled is definitely down, according to our figures. Yeah. Uh, sorry, um, I think what would be helpful is, um, obviously, our accounts will be published this year, around about September, and that will demonstrate a lot of these figures. But we'd be happy to write it in advance of that. I'm asking a more fundamental question, which, I'm, which I think has been skirted around so far this morning. We've got two major airports, in, well, three airports in the central belt, uh, and people want to go, uh, people are there to spend their money on a service, and they want to go uh, to an air, air, airport and get on a flight to where they want to go to. The problem seems to me, and I'm being radical here, I seem to be the only one voicing it, that you're in the wrong place. That Can I just uh, answer that question, Derek, if, if I may? The... Um I go back to the definition that Presswick is the closest airport to my home. It's where I would like to fly out of. And last year, there was 1.6 million passengers that fell into that category. So we only have roughly between six and 700,000 of that. So there's a potential of 1 million that currently is not exercising that catchment right to fly out of Presswick. And that's the number one microeconomic dynamic that we are following. So the management team, uh, business development team, their job is to find that uh, one million incremental packs as part of the, the process. So the airport's a big to differ. The airport's not in the wrong place. I'm hopeful that that's correct, and my impression is not it's the right one. It's stats. It's okay. When, therefore, I go back to my fundamental question about finance, if, it's, if you're so positive about the future of Prestwick, when, as a taxpayer, are we going to get our money back? Can I, I don't, I, I mean, it's partly tied into the question that I, I want to ask, and may, maybe we could just clarify this, just for us. The 2017 accounts are unaudited at the moment, I think, is, is what you said. But you will have a book value for the, for the airport, is that correct? A book value for the assets? We do, yes. And can you disclose the book value of the assets? Um, I, I'd, I'd rather not do that at this point in time. Just okay, could you, could, give me the book, could you give me the book value of the assets in 2016? The, the asset base is actually very low. It, it depends if you're talking about the assets within the accounts or the perceived assets uh, as would be valued at a later date. Okay, so the, there, is, <laughs> there must be a way of me being able to get the answer to the question of what is the, what is the value of the asset in 2016? In, not on income stream, on, on, on a book value. Yeah, in, in terms of that income, obviously, or that, that book value, obviously, because of the issue of impairment, uh, the book value doesn't recognise fully the assets that have been purchased over the last few years. So over the last three years, we have spent roughly about £12 million in the airport. That is not uh, recognised as an asset within the business. So it, it, I'm not trying to avoid the question, it's just that it's very difficult to give well, an appropriate answer. I, I think that the, the question that... that Mike and I probably are both trying to get to the bottom of is that if you if you have a book value of the assets uh, when 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 it when it's disclosed and we understand what the book value is if you add 39.6 million pounds uh, which is the loan up until 2022 is my understanding is that the 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 value of the airport should be in excess of those two figures and my question is and I guess what Mike is asking is that. In 2022, will the value of the uh, Presswick Airport exceed the 39.6 million plus the current value of the of the airport? Because if it doesn't, then then one has to ask whether it's it's an investment with a viable proposition, just from a business point of view. So it certainly has the potential to do that. Um, <laughs> sorry, my business. <laughs> I think every business would like to think it's got the potential to do it. Is it realistically going to happen? 
Yeah, with, with the, the plan in place and it is over the five years uh, and looking at the market at this point in time, we believe it is possible. Yes, I'd like them to respond to my question, which was when do they think the taxpayer, what year do they think the taxpayer will get their money back from the investment in your company? In terms of the strategic plan, we return to profitability within 2022. Um, there, thereafter, obviously, depending on cash flows, we would then look to, to start repaying the loan. Start repaying the loan. Yes. Mm. So, in terms of your cash flow is going to be what? So, I understand that. Uh, that that's the point where we break even. Uh, beyond that period is when we start Okay, to so how long will it take to repay 39.6 million, which is the investment between now and 2022, based on your strategic plan? Based on the projection we've got, uh, and we've done that for, for 25 years, we, we re reckon it'll be about 10 years after that date. Ten years, and the, in those 10 years, post-2022, the airport will generate 39.6 million, plus interest, plus running costs. Yes. Gosh, that's a lot of money. Uh, sorry, uh, John, did you want to come in on the back of that? Um, Stuart, <coughs> sorry. Um, I, just one advantage would be helpful to confirm uh, Presswick has the lowest uh, impact of weather of any airport, really, in the UK. Is that correct? Thank you. Sorry. To, uh, sorry. Yeah. Comment back to the question. Um, we were asked earlier about the attractiveness of Presswick to airlines. One of the things that we have is capacity. Uh, and you're saying about, you know, why would people want to go to Presswick when they can catch a flight from other airports in the central belt? The simple is, the, you know, the, a lot of airports in the UK, and those two in particular, are fast running out of capacity. Uh, it's something that we have in abundance, and it's certainly one of the things that's starting to attract the airlines so that we can not only give them the, the, uh, the uh, landings that require, or the slots required, but the timings of those slots. Because right now, it would be very difficult, and it's not for me to say, but for an airline to get a new slot at Edinburgh today would be pretty difficult, particularly at a time slot that would, they would prefer. So we do have that advantage, and that's what we're trying to exploit as, as, as part of building the, uh, the attractiveness of Glasgow Presswick to the airlines. OK, I'm going to let Richard come in very briefly before I ask Gail for the final question. I agree with you. That you do have the slots, and you do have the time. And you do. The other thing, you know, to go back to Mike Rumble's questions, if I stay in Mullow and I want to fly out of Edinburgh, it takes me some time to get there. If I want to go to Glasgow, it takes me some time to get there. The new M74 extension, M8 upgrade, da 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 it takes less time to get to Presswick. That's where you're falling down, guys. You're not advising people you can get to Presswick quicker than what you thought you could a year ago. We, we, ha we have gone down the path of launching a new campaign of communications about travelling times, um, both on the rail network, on the national coach network, uh, as well as driving it. And all of the things you've said there come, come into play. We do have things like half-price rail travel from anywhere in Scotland to Presswick Airport, but getting that message across has been quite difficult. So we are redoubling our efforts uh, to try and really communicate with the market to make sure people understand it. A lot of, a lot of the catchment that Glasgow sees its own, South West Glasgow, Newton, Merns, Wycray, etc., it's much, much easier to get to, to Presswick than it is to get to Glasgow, despite Glasgow being a, a bit closer. So it's getting that message across is a challenge, and that's certainly one we're very focused on. Ron, thank you very much for that. And, uh, and I'm going to give the final question, if I may, to the Deputy Convener, Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, we spoke a lot about Ryanair, and certainly um, Michael O'Leary has been very vocal on how he thinks that bre Brexit is going to affect uh, Scottish aviation. Can you tell me how leaving the European Union is going to affect Presswick Airport? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, obviously, we have a sort of what I call a, a Brexit risk overlay in the business. It wasn't something that we, we had planned for in the previous uh, plans for the business. And it will have significant uh, impact. But clearly, uh, no one individual is absolutely sure what the outcome is going to be. If we go back to the dark days of bilaterals, where there's restricted access in terms of duality of one country providing capacity and pricing against another country, you will significantly uh, reduce the size of the market. And uh, Ryanair and indeed EasyJet have capitalised on the freedom within the EU. Any airline, any nation can fly anywhere they want. And that turned Ryanair into the biggest airline in Europe 
first mover advantage, along with uh, EasyJet. So both these businesses, the low-cost businesses, uh, are uh, you know, somewhat exposed, one could say, in terms of the way forward. Uh, both airlines have taken uh, measures to, uh, to, to mitigate that. It's in the public domain. Caroline McCall, the CEO of uh, EasyJet, said yesterday they're incorporating the operating licenses of their whole fleet in the German domain so that through German location and air operating certificate licensing, they can access the other markets. So a lot of airlines are actually working around the, the outcome or the issues for Brexit. Uh, but no one individual knows. Uh, it's just a matter of looking at all the issues and preparing robust plans forward. And that's before you even consider the issues to do with US dollar to UK pound uh, currency denominations. Airlines cost about 70, 75 percent, if you're low cost, are denominated in US dollars. So a collapse in the currency, not collapse, a reduction in currency would be 20 percent, adds 20% to 75% of the cost base. So that's an impact that we're actually uh, feeling just now, just in foreign exchange. And that's before you even consider things like fuel. It's a very difficult way to navigate forward. Ron and his team in a very broad range of experiences and dialogues that I have with uh, people in the aviation industry, which is my background. I know a lot of people and we're in dialogue constantly to see how they are looking towards the way forward but nobody knows the one and only path. That's the issue that we have here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That, that, that's all the questions that we have for you. I, I suspect that we will be asking you to come back. I think it, you said it was your, your first uh, visitation to the committee. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it won't be your last visitation to the committee. And I suspect that when the accounts are audited and published that, that the committee may wish to see again. But I'd like to thank you uh, for coming and for being so open and, and honest where you could be uh, and to bring us up to speed on what's happening at Presswick. I'd like to briefly suspend, well, no, actually that concludes uh, the committee's business today. Um, so thank you very much for attending. to anybody or all of you uh, on the committee uh, to visit Presswick to give a sort of three-dimensional understanding of the business. We did offer that to the previous committee that we reported to the ICI committee. Okay. And uh, they were planned to come down, but uh, we're, we're open and transparent. So if you want to visit, we would welcome uh, you to, to come. I'm sure that, sorry, Andrew, I'm sure there's members of the committee that would like to come down and the clerks will tie it up and, and, and try and... Uh, make it at a time that suits the majority. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.